The idea we're looking at here is uh, what 1 Peter 3.16 says, which is always be ready to give a reason for the hope that you have. One of the ideas we looked at was a, as a Christian, most times we're really good at loving God with our heart. However, we're not so great at loving God with our mind. So this morning, you are going to use your mind just a little bit. Is that okay? I know it's rough for some of you. I get, I get it. I get it. Next week, we continue this series, and next week is, is a great topic. Next week, we're going to ask the question, answer the question, why do bad things happen? And so uh, join us next week. I, I'm sure you'll enjoy that. So this morning, I want to look at why should I believe that Jesus is God and that he rose from the dead? Now, here's, here's the big idea here. Historians have proven that Jesus did exist, both secular and Christian. It's not a, a question of if he existed. We know that he did. The question then becomes, did he rise from the dead? And so I want to help us logically go through some questions and, and just pose some questions and figure out, hey, can we prove not just what the Bible says is true, but can we logically get to the point of, yes, he did. Are you ready? All right, let's start with, who did Jesus say he was? Well, let's look at John eight fifty eight. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was even born, I am. John 14, 6, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you had really known me, you would know who my Father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. John 10, 30. The Father and I are one. Those are some pretty big claims, right? That's not, if you and I walked around making those statements, people would look at you weird. Maybe even get you thrown up in the uh, cuckoo's nest, right? You know, right? Am I, are you following with me? Yeah, this is interactive here, okay? Yes? Okay, so let's, John lists seven great I am's. And these are the I am's that Jesus made statements about who he was. So he says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. Again, big claims that are saying, hey, listen, this is how you, you, you get life. And he wasn't talking, obviously, about life here on earth, although life from earth does come from God, correct? But in Jesus' case, he's making it, I am eternal life. I am where you're going to get eternal life. And then I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I take care of my flock. He also makes the statements, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I am the true vine. Now, these words in, in any other person's mouth would be absurd, would be insane. But out of the mouth of Jesus, it makes perfect sense. I, I put a quote from C.S. Lewis, and, and the reason I like C.S. Lewis, C.S. Lewis was, was an, an atheist or agnostic. Now, for those of you who don't know, an atheist is someone who says, there is no God. An agnostic says, I don't know. There might be, but I don't know. Or I don't even care. And C.S. Lewis was in that boat. And he began to investigate. He began to really kind of disprove and discredit uh, what, what it is. I don't, I don't believe it's true, and so let's, let's prove this once and for all. I want you to look what he says. Among these Jews, there suddenly turns up a man who goes about talking as if he is God. He says he's always existed. Among pantheists, now we learned a couple weeks ago, a pantheist believes in multiple gods, okay? Anyone might say that he was part of God or one with God. There'd be nothing very odd about it. But this man, since he was a Jew, could not mean that kind of God. God, in their language, meant the being outside the world who had made it and was infinitely different than anything else. And when you've grasped that, you will see that what this man said, quite simply, is the most shocking thing that has ever been uttered by human lips. It's a big statement. So let's look at the resurrection options. What are the options for the resurrection? If, okay, so we know Jesus existed. Now we get to the story of the resurrection. What are our options? Option number one. Now, by the way, these theories are all have, already, have been presented by people. 
Okay, these are real options that people presented. We're going to walk through them. You tell me how, how you think they sound, all right? The first one is called the swoon theory. And that is that Jesus, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped one. Let's go, let's go back, go back, go back. That's my fault. All right, what are the resurrection options? You have the great hoax. The resurrection is a scam and a fake, okay? Resurrection is a scam and a fake. It's not real. Number two, it's mythology, the resurrection is made up and it's fiction. Or number three, it is the supreme event in history. The resurrection is true and is fact. Would you agree with all those three things? Does that make, make sense? It's either made up, not true, it's a story, it's fake, or it's real. That's our options. So let's go through some of the uh, proposed ideas to explain it. The first one is the swoon theory. Now, the swoon theory says Jesus did not really die. He just passed out. Now, it sounds plausible until you understand who did the crucifixion. The Romans. And if you understand Rome, and if you studied Roman history at this time, the Romans didn't make mistakes like this. There was no way the Romans made a mistake where the person on the cross accidentally kind of passed out and they didn't catch it. Okay, if that happened on their watch, the Roman guard was crucified and killed himself. Okay, so this is not plausible if you study history at all. The second one is the spirit. That Jesus did return, but he was a ghost. And uh, it, it was not a body, it was a, it was a spirit form. Okay, and he was just, ooh, right there, okay. Plausible, possible. But then you get to the question, if he was a spirit... When he met with the disciples, there was a certain disciple that said what? I want to touch you. I, I want to touch you. I, I won't believe it until I touch it. Let me touch the wound. Let me touch the, the hand. Let me touch the feet. And if Thomas, who was just one, if Thomas doubted and had a moment of doubt and he thought it was a spirit, there's no way that Thomas would have gone and sacrificed everything he knew and become a martyr for the gospel if it was a spirit. It doesn't make sense. Let's go to number three. Mass hallucination. The disciples were all hallucinating. They were in the garden, and something got to them, guys. Little dooby dooby doo. <laughs> it was just, you know, too much, and it just lasted, and all of them hallucinated the whole thing. Problem is this. Mass hallucination has never occurred. People don't hallucinate that way. You hallucinate, and it's individual. So this is totally unbelievable and not problem. problem. I'm sorry, it's too problematic to be uh, an answer. Myth. Well, it's a myth. It's, it's a myth with a moral teaching point. It's just a good idea. It, it's, it's, it gives the disciples something to believe in, and so it's really not uh, true. And this is for those especially who are, are basically say the supernatural does not exist. The problem, again, we go to is the disciples. If you think about this, if this is a story, if this is a myth, because we know Jesus is true and we know the, the accounts of the disciples are true, why would the disciples, all of them except one, suffer a martyr's death and suffer for the gospel if what they knew was just a fable and just a story? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that thousands of people during that first century were, were brutally and horribly executed by Rome for something that was a made-up fairy tale. The logic doesn't make sense. Well, maybe, maybe it was the stolen body. We, we read about that, that maybe it really was that the, the, the soldiers passed out and, and the disciples came and they stole the body. That's, that's really the truth. Well, that makes a good idea. And, and some people say, well, maybe the body was stolen by the Jews. Maybe the body was stolen by the Romans. Maybe the body was stolen by the disciples. Or maybe even Joseph of Arimathea stole the body. Well, if you logically go through any one of those, if the disciples stole the body, again, why would they sacrifice everything, a martyr's death, for what they knew to be fake? doesn't make sense. Why would the Romans steal the body? Because for Rome, and this is why in the, in the passage of Scripture we read, that they were paid off. Why? Because if this happened under their watch, they would be executed for this. Because the Romans took things seriously like this. And so this doesn't make sense either. 
Why would the Jews do it? The Jews had no reason to, to want Jesus' body. It, it just doesn't make logical sense. Or maybe it's the wrong tomb. I love this one. I, I don't know if you've ever had a loved one die, someone you care deeply about, and you bury them, and you leave, and you go home. And a couple days later, you come back, and you accidentally go to the wrong place because you don't remember where you buried them. There's not, it's not like we have graveyards either. Uh, tombs were a little bit different. And so this, this really isn't plausible at all. It's, it really doesn't make any sense. Especially when you consider that they say that everyone went to the wrong tomb. I mean, I could understand if one person, but everybody, really? Live for profit. Well, really what happened was the disciples made up the story so they could make a lot of money. Uh, the problem is this. All the disciples made no money. There was no income. There was no benefit for them. So this, again, does not make sense. It was mistaken identity. I love this one. The disciples mistook Jesus for someone who looked like him. It was, it was like this guy who just happened to look like him. He's risen. And the guy was like, sure, whatever. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, okay. Again, this doesn't make sense. If you're a disciple, why would you sacrifice everything? Uh, if you spent three years with someone, I'm pretty sure you weren't going to mistake his identity. Twin. This is, again, one of my favorites. Jesus had a twin. That really what happened is twin A was the one crucified. Twin B came back and he was resurrected. And that was their plan all the whole time. The problem is this. During this time and this day and time, it wasn't like they would have been able to hide Jesus' twin. Jesus' ministry, if you think about it, didn't start till he's 30 years old. So you're telling me that, that before Jesus really started a ministry, that Mary somehow knew what was going to happen, and she was hiding the twin from the rest of the world. Again, it doesn't make plausible sense. The last one here is bodily resurrection. That Jesus was raised from the dead, historically and bodily, and by the supernatural power of God. If you logically go through these, and I understand that that last number 10 may be hard to understand and hard to comprehend, but if you're talking about an all-powerful God, it makes complete plausible sense. The rest of them just don't make sense. Well, what are the types of evidence for the resurrection? There's two. The first one is subjective. And this is what's called the pragmatic test. It asks the question this, does it work? Does Jesus make a difference? And this is the question that you have to answer. If you've followed Jesus, if you've had a relationship with Jesus, the question you have to ask yourself is, does it make sense? Does Jesus work in my life? Do I, do I feel the connection with God? Have I experienced his presence? Have I seen him do a miracle? It's a personal test that you and I have to answer individually. The, the second one is objectively. It's looking at historical evidence. It's not a scientific issue. It's verified by probable sense. It's not absolute or improbable or impossible sense. It asks the question, does the evidence persuade us that the event actually happened? In looking at the evidence from an unbiased point of view, is it possible the event could have happened? Well, let me give you just a few things that you and I need to remember about the resurrection. The specific evidence is that we know. The first one is this. The naturalistic theories fail. A supernatural answer is logical. All those questions, all those ideas that we posed just a moment ago, none of them answer all the questions. They all have problems with them. They all don't make sense. And so there hasn't been a single idea proposed that there is a natural answer for the resurrection of Jesus. Number two, it does work and it meets genuine needs. Jesus changes lives. We've seen testimony. We've heard accounts. We've heard stories from missionaries. We've seen stories in our personal lives. But Jesus does change lives. Number three, the birth and con continuity of Christianity with the central message of the resurrection from the beginning. The story of Jesus, the story of the resurrection for over 2,000 years, has never changed. And when you think about all that Christianity, all that the story has been through, you would think at some point, maybe the story changes. It never did. It always stayed the same through persecution, 
through trials, the story of the resurrection continued through. Number five, or I'm sorry, number four, the change in the day of worship from the Sabbath to a Sunday by the Jews. Uh, typically, the, the Jews in the Old Testament, and when we first started, God created the world in seven days, correct? And on the seventh day, God rested, and that was considered the Sabbath. And so we all, the, the Jewish people, they all rested on the Sabbath. However, you and I worship on the first day of the week, and as we just read in the story, Jesus was risen on the first day of the week. So why would Jews all of a sudden change from a Sabbath last day of the week to a first day of the week celebration and worship. There's only one thing that would cause them to do something. It had to be something spectacular like the resurrection of Jesus. Number five, the women were the first witnesses. Now, ladies, please understand that in this day and time, ladies were considered to be, um, what's the word, less than men. It's not a good thing, but it's what was happened. Uh, women testified to see Jesus first. They were, um, their witness in the first century, uh, they were deemed unreliable. They were said to be not good witnesses. Why would, why would you say women saw Jesus first if it wouldn't help your case? If you want a, this case to be moved forward and you want people to believe it, why would you say women saw him first? It doesn't make sense. Unless it's true. See, in the Greco-Roman culture, a woman's testimony was not even admissible in court. And in the Jewish circle, the testimony of two women equaled that of one man. If one were to invent a story about the resurrection, the last people it would place as the first of the witnesses would be women. But you see, because the story is true, ladies, the women saw it first. The radical change in the disciples. I think about this. The disciples went from um, running away, hiding, to all of a sudden they have new power, new courage. They're all faithful to death. Listen, men will die for a lie, but men won't die for something they know is a lie. The embarrassing details of the resurrection. Historically speaking, the embarrassing details add to the truth of the claim. The fact that women were the first witnesses, the fact that a member of the Sanhedrin, the same Sanhedrin that executed Jesus, had to give him a proper burial, and that the disciples were all fearful and fled. That all serves as embarrassing factors for the account of the resurrection. If you were going to tell a story, you don't tell a story and it be embarrassing. Typically, you tell a story and you want people to believe it, so you tell something that's wow and amazing, right? You don't go, well, these guys were kind of scared and they ran off and, and then the lady saw them first and people, again, discount your story. The empty tomb, the fact there was no body. Now, think about, well, I'm going to get there in a second. Number nine. The numerous and various resurrection appearances. There are several different accounts of Jesus appearing. It wasn't just one. It wasn't just two. It was many. The impossible nature of mass hallucination. We've already talked about this. It just it doesn't happen that way. The multitude of Old Testament prophecies. Several Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled. It was proclaimed that this would happen. Number 12, the Jewish leaders could not disprove the message even though they wanted to. Now think about this. If the story was fake or made up or not true, why would the Jewish leaders pay someone off? You, you think about this. Of all the things the Jewish leaders wanted to do was to sweep this under the rug, to make it go away. And so anything they could try to do, you can believe they were trying to do it. But yet they couldn't stop it. Why could they not stop it? The only option is it really happened. The conversion accounts of two skeptics, James and Paul. Can I ask you a question? What would it take for you to believe that your brother was the son of God? Uh, no. 
James started off as a skeptic and, and actually thought his brother was crazy. But in the end, James said, he is the son of God. Now think about that. Paul. Paul would go around and he would persecute Christians and condemn them and kill them. And yet, drastically, he's converted and changed. The accepted, char accepted character and claims of Jesus. He claimed to be God. He claimed he would rise. Jesus, from the very beginning of his ministry, brought this out. That, hey, I am who I am. And in three days, and he alluded to this several times. And he said it was going to happen. The articles left in the empty tomb. Grave robbers don't leave articles behind. It wasn't like they were going, hey, let's steal the body and let's leave some stuff behind so that people think he rose from the dead. They weren't thinking that. If you're a grave robber, you take the whole thing. The unexpected nature of the resurrection. I want you to think about this. Even though Jesus claimed he would rise, all of the disciples were amazed when he did. They weren't expecting it. It wasn't like they were like, oh yeah, I knew he was going to do that. All of them were like, what are you talking about? He's risen. What? I got to go see it for myself. Right? It wasn't like they knew it. Even though he made claims, even though he said it, they weren't expecting it. Reliable eyewitness accounts that recorded the facts. New Testament books were written at an early date. The records have been substantiated by archaeological discoveries. Records have been confirmed by other historical records. Even secular historians recognize the authenticity of the New Testament. There's number 18. There's no motive. No power, greed, or lust. The disciples would hold no power behind claiming the resurrection is history. They were running around being threatened by Jewish and Roman leaders. As far as greed goes, they taught that you should not desire earthly possessions, but spiritual ones. So they weren't in it to make money. Lust was not a factor either. They taught celibacy before marriage and marital fidelity after marriage. So what was the motive? Why would they claim this? Again, it doesn't make sense. The guarded tomb. The tomb was guarded first by a large stone that was set in front of the tomb. It was customary and not unusual. The stone probably weighed between one and two tons, about the weight of a car. A small number of men could have put it in place, but typically where it, where it was put in place, it was sloped because it was not meant to be rolled away. And typically, I, I had the opportunity to go to Israel this last year, and it, and it was a, typically it rolled in like a tray almost, and it went down and it stopped, and, and just that's where it sat. It, was, it would be very difficult to move uh, just by, even with a few people. It was an impossible for a few men to even secretly roll it without people hearing and, and knowing what's going on. Second, the Roman guard. Think about this. The Romans then were sent to guard the tomb. Uh, if you remember in our story, we, we understood that the Sanhedrin, that the Jewish officials paid off the Romans. Why would they pay off the Romans? Because the Romans knew if they were caught sleeping on the job, it meant execution. So the leader said, don't worry, we'll take care of the governor. We'll make sure that everything's okay. We'll make sure you don't get in trouble. The third thing is to protect the tomb is it was a Roman seal was placed on the tomb. A Roman seal, if you broke that seal, it was death by crucifixion. And so you didn't mess around with the Roman seals. The disciples uh, were not bold until after the resurrection. It would not have made sense for them to go, let's go break the Roman seal and prove this. At this point in time in the story, that from what we know, they were scared. They were hiding. They were not, let's go take the kingdom. That didn't happen until afterwards, after 50 days after Jesus left. So why does this matter? Pastor Jason, why are, why are we even talking about this? You saw it in the video just a moment ago. Because if Jesus rose from the dead, it changes everything. 
Do you understand that, that Jesus, yes, we understand he was a man, he did exist. Historians have proved that. But if he rose from the dead, you and I have to bring an account for everything that Jesus did, for everything that Jesus said. If Jesus really rose from the dead, then everything changes. He was the Son of God. Now you and I have to understand how we live our life does matter. Heaven and hell are real. Everything changes. Well, if the evidence is there, then how come there's so many people against God? Why don't we hear more about it? Very simply is this. The truth is that many atheists, agnostics, and even doubters have investigated the resurrection. Many of whom, after they do so, become convinced and accept Christ as their Savior. The truth is, you don't hear a lot about it because no one wants to confront these questions because they know the answer. Just think about it. When you want to believe your own truth, do you investigate to find the real truth? Most of us do not, do we? I want to believe what I want to believe, and I don't really want to believe what you believe. I don't want to investigate the truth. I'm happy with my own truth. The truth is that Jesus not only did exist, but he rose from the dead. If you're still a skeptic and you aren't sure, then let's answer these last two questions. What are the Jesus options? What are the options? How do I, how do I answer this question of who Jesus was if, if I'm still not sure? I want to go back to C.S. Lewis and let's look and see what he said. I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claims to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who is merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic or on the level with a man who says he was a poached egg, or he would be the devil from hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and teacher. He has not left that open to us, he did not intend to. So what are our options? The first one is this, is that Jesus is a liar. He was not who he said he was, and he knew so. That Jesus lied the whole entire time. The problem with this idea is that liars tend to crack under pressure. Parents, you know this, don't you? If you have kids, you know this. As you squeeze and as you apply the pressure, someone's going to crack. Someone's going to tell the truth. Liars usually have a sufficient motive for lying. There are only negative consequences for Jesus lying. He has nothing to gain. Liars typically don't emphasize remarkable moral values. Jesus emphasized all the time about morality and the importance of truth and the importance of justice and importance of doing the right thing. Philosopher Douglas Gruthus said this, could Jesus be a great, and many would say the greatest moralist, as well as the greatest liar of all time? Well, the question answers itself. You can't do both. Liars typically don't stick up for the marginalized. Yet Jesus, if you watch his story, he always sticks up for the weak, for the innocent. Why would his followers die for a lie? Could you hang around someone for three years and maybe be duped? Absolutely. But then when the resurrection came around, if it didn't happen, you wouldn't sacrifice everything for a lie. The second answer is this. He's a lunatic. Jesus was a crazy man. He was cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. He, didn't, he was not who he thought he was, and he didn't know it. He was just out there. 
Can I answer a question? I don't, I don't know if you've any, ever of you have any, known anyone who's a little bit off. You ever known somebody like that? Maybe a couple screws are loose. Can I ask you a question? Can you tell they're off? Okay? Is that the type of person that you follow around and be like, hey, this guy's Jesus. No, you say, this guy needs to go in a loony bin. The New Testament writers amazingly were included in this accusation. They, they said uh, that they were, uh, they even said that, that Jesus, others ac accused him of being crazy. They said that. Gruthus, the, the uh, uh, philosopher, said this. It's also worth noting that in the gospel, writers don't shy away from reporting that some thought Jesus was insane. They had such confidence in the overall character that they were willing to record these contrary opinions without the fear of tarnishing who Jesus was. Now, if you thought a guy was insane, you'd say he's insane. You wouldn't say, well, people thought he was insane and him not be, right? It just doesn't make sense. Insane people don't speak the way Jesus did. I mean, think about some of the statements that Jesus made. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, that's a crazy idea, but it's not an insane comment. Right? An insane person is not that um, smart. Right? Jesus claims to be deity dwarfs all those of other religious leaders. For instance, the Dalai Lama uh, claims that uh, to be a reincarnation through his enlightened consciousness Jesus' claim was to be the incarnation of God. Muhammad said, I don't know the purpose of life. Buddha said, seek truth. Confucius said, I am not the way. But Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. That's not an insane person's comments. And again, we go back to the question, if you hung around with Jesus for three years, why would the disciples die for a lunatic? It doesn't make sense. Our third option is this. Jesus was a legend. It was a story. It was like Paul Bunyan in the Blue Ox. Made up fairy tale. Pixie dust. Peter Pan. It was a great story. Moral teaching. But it wasn't real. Well, Jesus had more biographies written about him than any other person in the ancient world. Roman Emperor Tiberius, who died in 37 AD, his earliest known biography was in somewhere between 110 and 120 AD, which is an 80-year gap. Likewise, Alexander the Great died in 323 BC, and his earliest known biography is 130 AD. A 450-year gap in biographies. Jesus had four biographies written about his life within a generation. Roman historian A.N. Sherwin-White argues this is way too quick for a legend to accrue, for a, to accrue, and it would be corrupt the main message of Jesus. By comparing Jesus' biographies to the ancient scholarlies and all the other biographies we accept, it can only be measured that Jesus and his story was true, was accurate. The Gospels are deeply concerned with history. If you look at just one uh, mention in Luke chapter 15, you'll see 15 mentions of historical people or places. Just in one verse. All of them proven to be true and accurate. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar... When Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod was the tetrarch of Galilee and his brother Philip was the tetrarch of the reason, I don't even know that word, Eterna and Trachius and Licinius was the tetrarch of Abilene. Fifteen mentions of governors and places all proven to be historically accurate. The writers of the New Testament weren't prone to lying. The disciples wouldn't, didn't change the story even when it would have benefited them. Even when it had been purposely, hey, if you do this, if you say this, it makes you look good. They didn't change the story. The New Testament writers didn't have a good motive for inventing a divine Jesus. Think about this. Pagans and, and Jews were hostile to the message of God. As a disciple and follower of Christ, the moment you claimed the resurrection, the moment you claimed the deity of God, your life was continuously under fire. 
You went from place to place hiding and suffering. It wouldn't make sense to go through all of that if the story wasn't real. The last op option is this, that Jesus is Lord. That he was who he said he was, and the resurrection proves it to be so. So what are my options? For you and for me, what, what are our options? We really have two options. If the worship team would go ahead and come up. Option number one is this. We reject it. We ignore it. We refuse to believe it. Even with the evidence that I've presented to you this morning, the options that we've looked at, you still say, I don't believe any of it. If that's your answer, I really can't help you. Or you come up with this answer is this. You accept it. And you allow God to rescue you from death. Because in reality, Jesus coming to earth, dying on a cross, was the greatest rescue in human history. We see a story in Romans. Which you look at Romans chapter 5 verse 8. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Romans 3.23, for everyone has sinned. And we all fall short of his glorious standard. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 10.9, if you openly declare that Jesus is the Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 5.1, therefore, since we made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Galatians chapter 1 verse 3. May God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, give you grace and peace. Jesus gave his life for our sins, just as God our Father planned, in order to rescue us from this evil world in which we live. Finally, Colossians 1 13. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness, transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son, who purchased our freedom and forgave our sin. I hope two things happen here this morning. That number one, you're able to defend your faith and defend the idea of the resurrection through now some logical knowledge, not just the heart that you and I should have in loving God. And number two is this. If you came in this morning and you were a skeptic, if you came in this morning and you weren't sure that I presented enough evidence for you this morning that there's only one answer. Jesus is Lord. That he sacrificed and died on the cross so that you and I could know him and live in eternity with him. I'd like to ask you just a couple questions this morning. If you would. If you would say this morning, Pastor Jason, I, I don't have a relationship with God. But I want to. I, I don't, maybe you say that I, I, I've never asked God to come into my heart. Maybe you said I did at one time, but if I'm honest, the way I'm living now, no one would know if I serve God or not. But this morning, I want to change. This morning, I want a fresh start. I want a new beginning. Many of you in here are, have already made this statement, but for you, for some of you that have not, I'd like to pray for you this morning. If that's you, if you'd say, I need to know God. I need to know Jesus. I need to ask forgiveness. Would you stand wherever you are? Would you come down front and join me so I can pray with you? So if you can't make this decision in front of people who love God, you'll never be able to make this decision at work or at school or the places you and I go. If it's you this morning, you say, I, I want to commit. I want to make a choice. Okay. Next question I have is this. You and I have then said, I love God and I want to serve Him. 
He's the king of my life. In the story we read this morning, the last verse said, go and make disciples. Teach them everything I've commanded you. So my question is this. Are you sharing what you know? Are you sharing the resurrection story? Because if you look at the disciples' life, the moment they heard the story of the resurrection, they doubted. They wanted to see it with their own eyes. They wanted to believe it. But then once they believed it, what happened? They had to tell everybody. Sometimes as Christians, we're guilty because we're embarrassed. We're afraid of what people might think or might say. If you look at the story of the disciples and those who followed Jesus, they suffered. It wasn't pretty. Some of them died. You and I, we're afraid that someone might make fun of us on social media. We're afraid that we might lose a friend. We're afraid of what people might think of us. Can I pose a a better question? What does God think of you? Because if I know what God thinks about me, it doesn't matter what people think. So here's what I'd like to do. We'd like to make one call to you to respond, if you would. We're going to sing one song, and then we'll dismiss. But if you would say, Pastor Jason, I believe in the resurrection. I believe in Jesus. But I realize I need to share my faith. I realize I haven't done that. Maybe there's somebody in your life you want to share your faith with. Maybe you want to pray for them right now. Maybe you want to ask God to give you courage to say the right words. But you would be willing to say, I know the story. I believe the story. And I need the courage to do something about it. If that's you this morning, would you stand? Would you come forward? And just spend a moment up here at the altar area and just pray as we sing. If you would say, I need courage to go share my faith, to share my story, to share the story of the resurrection right now, stand, come forward. As the worship team sings, you can come forward anytime. When they're done, we'll pray and dismiss you. But you would say, I need somebody to know. Maybe there's somebody in your life you want to pray for specifically up here. I encourage you to come forward and pray for them.